Hello and welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about leaving groups. But before we get into that, let's look at the practice questions that I assigned last lecture. So first we started with uh, this propyl chloride, or chloropropane if you prefer. Now in this case, hydroxide is the nucleophile and it's attacking at the primary position and it's displacing chloride. Um, the chloropropane is the electrophile. Uh, in reality, this type of reaction could work to some extent, but there's competing reactions that would uh, occur. So this is just like a simplified reaction. Now, if we look at the chloropropane, the carbon where the nucleophile attacks is the electrophilic center, as it's the center that's engaging in the reaction. And the nucleophage is the chloride, which is, again, the leaving group, if you don't recall. Now, for the next problem... Um, we want to draw the mechanism of the reaction. We also want to identify the reactant, the reagent, and the solvent. So here in this uh, scheme, we have the reactant on the left. The reagent is present above the reaction arrow. In this case, we're using sodium cyanide. And the solvent are, of our reaction is dimethylformamide. Now, even though we haven't talked about cyanide as a nucleophile yet, you might have seen on the nucleophilicity spectrum chart that cyanide is one of the carbon nucleophiles that exists. And this is actually a really great way to extend a carbon chain by one whole carbon. So this is a very useful synthetic tool. Now the downside is it's cyanide. And if you know anything about cyanide, it's probably that you know it's very toxic. Um, however, it's still a good building block. So here, the cyanide just comes in and attacks at this carbon, displacing bromide as the nucleophage, um, affording this cyanoethylbenzene as the product. Now, before we get into today's content, I wanted to introduce a few extra common reagents. So the first one here is TBS chloride. TBS just stands for tert-butyl dimethyl silyl. Um, what this is good for is protecting alcohols. So if you have multiple alcohols in a, fun in a molecule, you might want to protect some of them so that you can do chemistry on the other ones. The other advantage of this is the protecting group usually makes the compound more lipophilic, more greasy, we would say which means it's going to be more soluble in common nonpolar solvents, which is often desirable for synthetic chemists, because we want to avoid working with water most of the time, because it's kind of annoying to get rid of. The next compound I want to talk about is mesyl chloride. Similar to tosyl chloride, which we talked about last time, mesyl chloride is a nice convenient liquid, um, so you can install this onto an alcohol to make it a good leaving group. It's something we're going to talk about as the main topic today. Finally, there's triflic anhydride. Triflyl chloride also exists, but um, triflic anhydride is the more commonly uh, obtained form. You can use this to install a triflate. Um, sometimes we call this trifluoromethane sulfonic anhydride, but we tend to abbreviate names as much as possible. So this is a lot like mesyl chloride. Triflates are just a little bit more reactive. Okay, now for today's subject matter, leaving groups. So there's generally a spectrum of leaving groups that are at our disposal when we want to do chemistry. Um, when you're choosing a leaving group, you definitely want to consider a number of factors. How stable is the leaving group? If you're doing actual synthetic chemistry on the bench, are you going to be using them today? Are you going to be preparing the leaving group in situ and then like immediately doing a reaction? Or are you trying to make a bottle of it that you're going to leave for like a year or two? So depending on what you're planning on doing, you have to choose the appropriate leaving group. Um, the other thing is relative reactivity. If you're going to be reacting these electrophiles with very poor nucleophiles, you're going to need a very reactive electrophile, otherwise the reaction could be really slow and sluggish. And so while other leaving groups exist, this gives you a good idea of the main leaving groups that you tend to see in organic chemistry. So starting with choice, uh, if you're just doing uh, theoretical chemistry, if you're just taking a course and you're not doing any lab work, you can usually use them fairly interchangeably, um, but I would generally recommend choosing somewhere between a bromide to a sulfonate, including an iodide. Now, chlorides are usually too poor for most reactions, not all reactions, but a lot of reactions. And so chemists eventually get numb to them and just go overkill most of the time for bromides, iodides, or sulfonates. The exceptions here would be benzylic, allylic, propargylic chlorides, um, because it tends to activate the leaving group, and so they tend to be more reactive than your typical chloride. Um, if you want to prepare bromides, um, they're somewhat annoying to prepare, so you don't see them made as much in the literature. They tend to be commercially available, but not as often prepared. 
Um, iodides can be prepared fairly easily, but they're not very stable long term. Um, but you do see them used quite a bit because they tend to be quite reactive. Finally, sulfonates are easy to prepare from alcohols. Alcohols are like all over the place all the time, so it's quite easy to prepare sulfonates. So starting with chloride, so there's different preparation methods for alkyl chlorides. Um, for some chlorides, such as benzyl chlorides, you can actually just treat benzyl alcohol with hydrochloric acid. This just produces water and the desired benzyl chloride. But um, for many substrates, using concentrated HCl is undesired. Um, additionally, side reactions such as elimination and other uh, chemistry can occur. So we want to use methods that tend to be selective so that we can predict what's going to happen, because that's most that's one of the main goals that we're trying to achieve as chemists. Predict what's going to happen, see it occur, and hopefully it'll occur in a really clean manner. So the first approach is to use something called thionyl chloride. Um, another approach is the apple reaction. Some people say apel, but apple is also quite common. And so I'll show the apple reaction in a later scheme, but first let's look at thionyl chloride. So um, in this reaction, you have an alcohol, thionyl chloride, and you usually use some sort of base, such as pyridine is the most common. This results in the formation of an alkyl chloride, HCl, and sulfur dioxide. The HCl would usually be absorbed by a base, but if you heat this to reflux without a base, you can usually get these reactions to go anyway, but the mechanism is slightly different. So the mechanism for the base-mediated reaction is as follows. First, the alcohol attacks on the thionyl chloride. The electrons of the sulfonyl swing up onto the oxygen. Here I've just drawn it in a little clearer way. Um, the electrons can swing back down, um, eliminating a chloride. The proton on this oxygen, which is positively charged, gets abstracted by a base. Now for a base such as pyridine, it usually isn't strong enough to abstract a proton from an alcohol. However, from this activated species, it would be made more acidic and at this point, the base could intervene. Now we have essentially what looks like a sulfonate. It's a good leaving group that's generated in situ. The chloride that we just displaced from the sulfonate, sulfonate is able to come back in and attack at carbon, displacing this all as a leaving group, which eliminates chloride as well, and in, as it forms sulfur dioxide. So the second reaction, which works for chlorides, bromides, and iodides, is called the apple reaction. And the apple reaction uses a combination of triphenylphosphine. Occasionally other phosphines are used, but for the most part, triphenylphosphine is what's used. Various bases. Um, and then an electrophilic uh, halogenating oxidant. So this could be carbon tetrachloride, carbon tetrabromide, and chlorosuccinamide, and bromosuccinamide, and iodosuccinamide, etc. So the main reason you wouldn't want to use this reaction is the triphenylphosphine oxide and the triphenylphosphine are both kind of annoying to get rid of, practically speaking. If you're just doing chemistry on paper, this is great. In reality, it can just be a bit of a nuisance. Um, but as this is a widely used reaction, there's methods to remove these impurities. So the mechanism of this reaction works as follows. So triphenylphosphine has a lone pair. This is able to attack the positively the partially positive charge on this N-halosuccinamide in the case of an N-halosuccinamide. Um, this effectively oxidizes the phosphorus 3 species to a phosphorus 5. Um, this phosphorus 5 species can then undergo attack by an alcohol, displacing the halide. Um, we now have what is called an oxophosphonium species. This is a really good leaving group because triphenylphosphine wants to form triphenylphosphine oxide. That activates this position for an attack by a halide. Uh, forming the desired alkyl halide through the elimination, through the displacement of triphenylphosphine oxide. Now, if you want to prepare alkyl bromides, you can use thionyl bromide. It's the same as thionyl chloride, a little bit less stable and a little bit more sensitive, so you don't see it used as much. But I can tell you based on personal experience that it works quite well. Now, if you try using pyridine as a base, it just instantly decomposes the, the um, thionyl bromide to a mixture of products such as pyridinium tribromide. So it's important to not use pyridine as a base. I've had luck using inorganic bases, um, but there's not a ton of guidance in the literature. This is just anecdotally based on my experience. So as I was saying earlier, bromides are kind of annoying to prepare. When people do prepare them, they tend to use the apple reaction. So the one we just talked about, you just use N-bromosuccinamide or carbon tetrabromide. Now, in the case of iodides, uh, the apple reaction is probably the most common using carbon tetraiodide or N-iodosuccinamide with triphenylphosphine. 
However, if you have access to the chloride, bromide, or mesylate, you can just treat this with sodium iodide or tetrabutyl ammonium iodide, uh, and you could displace this to form the desired uh, iodide. Now, in the case of sulfonates, um, sulfonates are easy to prepare from alcohols. Um, however, you can also prepare them from alkyl iodides and bromides, which is uh, a strategy that's not often discussed, but it works quite well. So in this case, oxygen just attacks, displaces chloride, forming a sulfonate. You use a base to drive this reaction forward, such as triethylamine or pyridine. Um, however, if you want to do the opposite reaction, where the halogen's on the alkyl compound, and you want to use the sulfonate as the anion form, you can just make the silver salt of it, and then it, precips the, it precipitates the insoluble silver halide. Um, and so this is a really clever way to make uh, sulfonate derivatives. Now, the one disadvantage is it's pretty wasteful in terms of using silver, but if you're doing synthetic chemistry, uh, it's, it can be useful sometimes, depending on your molecule. So if you're doing just hypothetical chemistry on paper, this is a great strategy to use. The last leaving group we're going to talk about today is the diazonium. These are usually prepared in situ, especially in the case of uh, like uh, alkyl diazoniums. Aryl diazoniums can be a bit stable, but it just depends. Now, in the case of alkyl ones, they're very, very unstable, and you're usually preparing them in situ. So if you did this reaction with hydrochloric acid, you could convert this to the alkyl chloride very, very easily. So what happens is uh, this nitrogen is able to attack the nitrogen of the nitrite, uh, eliminate water and alcohol, forming the, di the diazonium. It's necessary to have a stabilizing counter ion such as tetrafluoroborate to isolate these, um, but most of the time, as I said before, uh, you're just preparing these in situ. And so finally, I'm going to assign two practice problems. So the first one is uh, propose conditions to prepare the following compound. So based on what we just talked about, see if you can suggest conditions that would afford the, the final product here from this first product. Um, an additional problem I'd like to assign is determine which of these two positions reacts first. If you're not sure what MSO is, that's a mesylate group, methane sulfonyl group connected to an oxygen. And so you just need to predict whether the chloride or the mesylate will react first and then draw the structure of the product. And so hopefully this has been a helpful video for discussing leaving groups. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you have any suggestions about how the series could be done better, I'd be happy to hear them. And with that, I hope you have an excellent day. Thank you.